anything in your life that would cause you today, if you take the Lord's Supper, to bring shame to his name? Is there anything in your life, any reason why he would consider you unworthy, a blemish to his name, if you took the Lord's Supper today? If there is, you need to take care of that. You can do that right now where you are. Ask him to cleanse you. And I ask you to pray one other thing, and then we'll go right to the word. In Jeremiah, God had Jeremiah write these words. Your word, O Lord, is like a hammer that hits my hard place and crushes it. Will you pray for God to use the hammer in your life this morning through the preaching of the word that the hammer of his word would hit your hardest, hardest, stubborn, non-submissive place and that he would break it? Will you ask him to speak to you so strongly that it felt like a hammer or maybe even a sword that pierces your heart? Will you pray that right now? Ask him to speak to you. So, Father, you do a searching in this place, a searching that brings forth a cleansing and a, that prepares even your children for taking the Lord's Supper in a way that would not bring dishonor to you. But, Father, I also ask that you would speak to all of us in such a way that we, there was no doubt that you were speaking to us. I pray, Father, that when this service is over and the days ahead, I will hear from your people and they will say to their spouses, to their parents, to others around them, to their friends, that they will declare today that you spoke to them. Speak in such a way that calls them from where they are to where you are. May you find a submissive spirit in us that doesn't just look up towards you, that doesn't stagger towards you, that doesn't walk towards you, but that you find in us a desire to run to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go to Job. Job is probably not a book that you are often in. It's before Proverbs and Psalms. It's, it's the oldest book in the Bible. You may not know that. Job is actually the first written word that God had re written. It predates Abraham. It's an old, old book. It predates the giving of the law. It predates all of the temple and the tabernacle and all the stuff that we know as Jewish life and Christian life. It's an old, old book. In it, in, in Job 38, verse 3, and I've had uh, Velva put it up, and it, you're going to be able to see it in several translations. Um, this is a simple message. I told the men that were praying over me, this is a very simple gospel message. It deals with four questions that God began to lay in my heart within the last two weeks. I had another message. I was going to do continue with the I wills. I forgot that today was the Lord's Supper. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, well, I, I, I'm not going to do that. And I said, so Lord, what do you want? And he said, you know what I've been speaking to you? I want you to put that all together and do it. So four questions. That God has asked his people. We're going to deal with it first of all from Job 38 verse 3. It says, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Other translations. Brace yourself like a man. I'm going to question you 
and you shall answer me. Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Now you may think that you can get out of here today without answering the questions. I may think that I can get away from ans answering the question. But once the question comes from God to you, you will have to answer those questions. It's better now than before him. The first question, by the way, I wasn't expecting Y Square to make it back, but we're glad you guys, you have a great, tr great time? Good. We're glad you're here. So the first question is found in Acts. And I know that Thumper actually dealt with this question uh, when he preached. I don't know when that was because usually when he preaches, I'm not here. And so, um, but it's the first question that God laid on my heart is in Acts chapter 2. Um, the question is found in verse 37. So we're going to start with verse 37 and read through verse 39. Now when they, there's thousands, thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem for the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon Jesus' disciples. They stand up in the midst of these thousands of people, and they begin to proclaim to them about Jesus, and they tell them what, what they have just done to Jesus. Not the disciples but what the Jews had done to Jesus. And they proclaim what they've done to the Messiah, the one and only, their only chance for salvation. And then basically, that's the same thing today. When you realize how you live your life is a declaration of what you're doing with Jesus. If you continue to live your life ignoring him or telling him later, later, you're declaring to him that you are still God of your life, your Lord. And it doesn't work that way. The moment you tell God one time, later, or someday, you're declaring to him, my knee will not bow. I am king of my life. I'm going to do what I want to, and you're in it, and I'm going to even tell you when. And you know what God does? That, no way. That's not the way it works. You probably won't be hearing about from me for a while. You're, my spirit won't be coming. But every now and then, I'm going to show up in your life. And you're going to have a choice once again to make that same kind of declaration one day and then one day won't ever come because my spirit will stop striving with you. And you never know when that is. They were gathered and Peter preached about who Jesus was and what God had done in sending his son to save them, to redeem them, to be the Christ, to be the Messiah, the Redeemer for all of Israel and for all the world. And thousands hear it. And when they hear it, something happens. It was like a sword. They're cut to the heart. They're convicted. They realize what they have done. And so it says, now when they heard this, they were cut in the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, here's their question. This is not a question coming from God. This is a question coming from them. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, Peter seized that moment and he said, to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. What shall we do? It's a, it sounds like a counseling question, and a question. I hear that over and over again. Somebody will say, I need to talk to you. We'll sit down. We'll have a conversation. At some point, at some point, they will say, what shall I do? Or what shall we do? What, what am I supposed to do? And generally in that in the midst of that question, they're looking for guidance. They're looking for some answers. And a good, good counselor doesn't usually just say, this is it. They help them work through their questions. So they'll say, what's your options? What's your options? 
What are some of the things you, you could do? Depending on what the situation is, they go through the options, and I say, which one do you think is the option God wants you to take? And they'll work through it again, and sometimes they'll come down to one or two. I'm not sure which one it is. I don't know which one God wants me to do. I say, well, that's God's responsibility, not mine. God will show you which one, and you will know. Well, this is not a counseling session. Peter and the disciples are not trying to counsel thousands of people. Can you imagine? It's one thing. Let's say that one or two of you today were to come to me and say, Don, God's been speaking to me. What should I do? Oh, my goodness, I would jump on that. And you would already know by the time you came to me to ask, you would already know what you're supposed to do. All I would do is say what the Lord has already been saying to you. But can you imagine? They're preaching and proclaiming to thousands of people. And as one voice, not one or two, but all of them, they all say, what shall we do? Oh, my goodness. If you could hold back the tears... If you could hold back the overwhelming presence, oh my goodness, this is a God thing. This is a divine a moment. I'm in the middle of it all. If you could hold back all that flood of emotion. The answer is always the same. The answer is always the same for someone who is not living according to God's will or desire for him. The answer is always the same. You need to repent. In other words, you, you need to stop the way you are doing and what you are doing. And you need to have a total new direction. And that direction, that new direction is found in following Jesus. I said it easier than. There are certain. Every now and then, and even thinking this statement and saying it, I feel a, a flood of arrogance. I, I don't, don't hear it that way. That's not the way I, I, I do not want it to come across that way. I've been preaching the Word of God for over 45 years. Forty-five years with one book. When I went to work with the convention, when they were hire and interviewing me, the executive director asked me the question, he said, what books do you read? There was no, there was no sense of arrogance or self-righteousness in it. it. He didn't know me. He didn't know that I'm a very, very slow reader. He didn't know that I really hate to read. That it, I, it is a discipline for me to read anything. And so I looked at him, and I said, I don't have a lot of time. And the time that I do, I made a decision a long time that there's probably only one book I need to be reading, and it's not a book about this book. It's this book. And I don't mean that arrogant. If you read like I do and, and have a hard time understanding you would probably answer the same way. There's no other book to read. Why in the world would I want to read any other book? Why would I want to spend any moment or time reading another book about this book when I can read that book? But with that said, after 45 years, you would think that I, I, knew, to, I knew this book. What happens is that 
because you can't remember it all. I can't. And the older I get, the harder it is to remember. What happens, you begin to put some nails up. Sort of like that coat rack over there. You begin to put some nails up and that you can hang things on. Because people are going to ask you questions. They might ask you about the Trinity. Where's the Trinity? Oh, that's in oh, Romans chapter 8. Let me show you. Why don't I have to worry? Oh, that's good. Romans chapter 8. <laughs> Where does it say that that it's only in Jesus and that I can't make it better? Oh, there's a bunch of places. But let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. If you ever start reading the prophets of the Old Testament, you realize they had a big nail. Actually, there was two nails for the prophets. Every prophet does the same thing. Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Ten Commandments. And... Deuteronomy chapter 28, blessed, the blessing and curse chapter. That's all the whole chapter is. If you do this, you, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be cursed. And so the prophets, every sermon is from Deuteronomy 28 or Deuteronomy 6. Let me tell you something. You need some nails like that. When it comes to repentance, there's just one verse. And it's not where you would think about it. It's in a section where a man who declares that he is a Christian is sleeping with his mother. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, God writes. He's not writing to Jews. Jews would have already known the answer. He's writing to non-Jews, pagans. And he tells them, you want to know what godly repentance is? And God tells them, there are seven marks, or some people call them seven signs, or some people call them seven characteristics. I prefer the seven evidences of repentance. And so every time I read the word repent, I know I don't get to define it. And yet, the Christian American church, which is made up of pagans, not Jews, it is probably the least understood doctrine and theological truth, even among teachers and religious leaders. And yet God knew it would be a problem with us. So he wrote it down and he told us a seven characteristics or evidences of true godly sorrow or repentance. So I'm going to read those seven to you just so that you understand what repentance and understand that the audience that Peter is talking about, talking to, he doesn't have to unpack it because they're Jews. They know what repentance is, but we're not Jews. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11 we read these words. Now, he's already talking. He said, there is a worldly repentance. There is a worldly sorrow. And then there is a godly sorrow or a godly repentance. And he's saying, you better have the godly repentance because I don't care. God doesn't care about the worldly repentance. You know what worldly repentance looks like? I'm sorry. I confess and then you run right back to the same thing. That's not godly repentance. That's not biblical repentance. So what does biblical repentance look like? So it says, for observe this very thing, that sorrow in a godly manner, godly repentance. First of all, understand what diligence, or some translation says, what carefulness or what earnest means. It means that when God's Spirit convicts you about your sin, it, 
is all you can see. You know, look away from it. All you can see is what God is showing you. That's ugly. That's evil. That has to go away. I'm not going to be there where that exists. That has to go. You are so focused, so earnestly careful about what he is showing you. That's the first step. You can't get away from it. Second, that earnest diligence, carefulness, produces a clearing of yourselves. A clearing of yourselves. That means a fervent desire for holiness. A fervent desire for God. Here you are. God convicts you. You have a diligent, earnest desire. You can't get it out of your mind. But you're consumed with an earnest, fervent desire for what God wants. You don't just say, okay, I'm sorry, and go back. When you have true repentance, you're consumed by what God really wants. You want holiness. It's not done yet. You still haven't repented yet. You're just getting closer. You've only gone through the first two steps. Third step. What indignation. By the way, that means what anger. Wait a second. I understand the first two, but now all of a sudden I got anger? What's this anger? You're not angry at God. You're not angry with yourself. You're angry at what your sins have done. It's no longer what you did. Now you're angry at the consequences for what you've done. We're still not there yet. Have you ever felt that angry? Ever just realize, oh God, I know I've done this to myself. I put myself in this situation. God, I hate, I hate what I've done. Because what we do now doesn't just damage us. It damages those we love. It damages those that we're in relationship. It damages those that are watching. And we go, oh God, I hate what I've done. Still not repenting yet. What ferment or vehement desire. What vehement desire. You're back to where you began. You're angry at your sin. But now you're back again with this overwhelming desire not only for you to be holy, but to make sure that the unholiness that you've sown in somebody else's life stops. And see, that's one of the strongest things that keeps you from going back. Because the more people you love and the more people you know that are watching, the more people that you care for, when you get to this step after you're being done being angry at the consequences that you're living, you all of a sudden awaken up that what you've done has affected others. And you can't sit idle. And it's gone past to saying to God, forgive me. Now you realize there's others that's going to have to forgive you. And then the next one is what? Zeal. <laughs> it's like this, all right? I'm a 65-year-old man, but every now and then I can still run. It's like this. All of us, you come. So you got this desire. Oh, God, I'm no longer just angry about what I've done and the consequences. Now I'm concerned about what it's done and what I've done to others. And so now you're, you're just running. You got this zeal. You got this energy. And you're going and you're saying, 
It's when a husband says, and it's beautiful when it's happened, and some of you have done it, when a husband says to their wife, oh, okay, you need to forgive me. God has forgiven me, but I need your forgiveness. I am so sorry for what I've done. It's when a father or a mother turns to their children and says, I am so sorry for not living for the Lord sooner. It's when you go to work, and that person has been working with you, and you've not lived the way that you should have, and you say to them, you need to forgive me. For I brought my sin into your life. You understand, it's, it's more than just, repentance is much more than just coming and sitting in a church again. That zeal produces vindication for what is known as restitution. You're not coming to them and saying, please forgive me. If it would be Daniel, you guys having a problem finding me today on the camera? If it's Daniel, I would come to him and say, Daniel, I need you to forgive me. But you need to know that I am committed to living a life in your presence that changes the way you think about God and about me. It's when a wife or husband say it to each other, I'm going to be different in the house now. It's restitution or vindication. It's when you say to your workplace or your world or even to the church, that's repentance. That's godly sorrow. And you and I do not get to skip a step. It's far bigger than you just coming up and saying a prayer. He's desiring a change from you and I. That baby is really good for handling all that screaming. So the first question, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with what God has done through his son for you? What are you going to do? Going to walk away just like it doesn't mean anything? Slap him in the face? Pierce him in the side? Spit on him again? Christian, what are you going to do today and tomorrow? Get rid of your excuses. What are you going to do? The answer was, you've got to change. You've got to repent. And others will see it. Sunday school, we talked about James. Faith without work is dead. And the whole idea is that it's what other people, it's not just what you see. I told this story. Man, time. <laughs> Back in 1979, I know this goes out. I want to give his first name. I don't even know whether he's still alive. Back in 1979, I had a dear friend that worshipped with me. His name was Carl. I had just answered a call to ministry, and so he and I made a trip to the Christian bookstore. He was driving. We're on our way home, and out of the blue, he says to me, I don't think I'm saved. And I've never done what I did next ever again. And I spent the next 30 to 45 minutes convincing him why he was saved. And he listened to my voice instead of the voice of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't long after we moved away, I contacted my pastor just to do a checkup on everybody. He said, 
Carl is so far into the world. He's given himself to alcoholism. You listen to me. The devil has no benefit in you questioning your salvation. None at all. You understand that? The devil doesn't have anything to benefit. When the devil would whisper, that is, it's only because of why. The devil only has access to one of his children unless God gives permission. But God has everything to benefit when he begins to speak to you. See, you may have a faith in something. Maybe even in an act that you did at one time and place. But the reason you would question your salvation is because there's no fruit. And you know it. And that's what James chapter, what was chapter 2 was all about. A faith without works has no life. It's dead. It has no life. It's dead. It's useless. And he even says, what senseless, foolish man would think that it does? In other words, figure it out. Faith without evidence is useless. And faith that is only expressed on a Sunday for a very limited time is a useless faith. So what are you going to do? Man, let's do the other three questions a lot faster. Next question. Also found in Acts, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And this question was even hinted at in the first question. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 37. Philip is on the road. He's just shared what God has done to a pagan, to an Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch does this in verse 36. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. Listen, here's this question. What is hinders me from being baptized? Pretty simple question. So you've repented. You've put your faith in Jesus. You did what you were supposed to do. What do you do next? Well, you start following him. You put one foot in front of the other right behind his. You start following him. And so this Ethiopian eunuch who's never, has never been in a Christian church, Here's the gospel one time. He knows that the next question is, so what's stopping me? What is hindering me? What's the answer? Only you. There's nothing else. No, only you. All of your excuses, all of your reasoning doesn't fit. Some of you think, I don't want to send a message that baptism saves. Get over it. That's not your real reason. All of your excuses die. What is stopping you? And the answer is, it's not the devil. It's not a demon. It's you. You're it. You're the hindrance. Because it's not that you don't know what you're supposed to do. Right? You know what you're supposed to do. Repentance, as it said in Acts, repent and what? Be baptized. Re true repentance leads to a baptism, baptized life. 
It just, you can't get past it. Third question, Romans. Romans is one of those books I go to a lot. I have figured out if a long time ago, if I can master Romans and James, most of the questions that I will deal with are there. There's a few others I have to find somewhere else, but Romans carries most of the questions or answers. Here's the third question. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How long shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Now look what he does. He picks up from the second question. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness life. So what's the question? Shall you and I continue to walk and live in sin? And the answer is, no way. Definitely not. It is a complete contradiction against the first answer to the first question. Godly sorrow, godly repentance does not allow you Live in your sin. Doesn't mean you don't sin, but it doesn't allow you to live in your sin. Fourth question. It's found in James. James, and it's found in Matthew. This question comes up everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. In James chapter uh, 3, verse 11. Does a spring bring forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine fig branches or figs? Thus, no spring yields both salty water and fresh water. You hear the question? Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? What's the answer? No. That cave right there next to my house that has flown water out of it continuously, not only during the 20 years I've lived there, but all the years before, my neighbors can never remember it going dry. That water is always fresh. It's not one day salty and one day fresh. The answer is, can you live a dual life? Can you live a dual life? Absolutely not. So don't, so don't even think there. Don't even go there. Don't even think that you can live two different lives. Your life, I used the illustration this morning, as you pass through people, you're dropping fruit. As you walk by, you're dropping fruit. Some people are going to see those and pick them up. What you drop reveals what you really are. Do you know I, there are several reasons why I'm on Facebook. One, because most of you are. And it's a good way to minister to you. Second is, oh, my, my whole network of friends are on Facebook. It's a good way to meet them. But you know why another reason I'm on Facebook Because people leave their fruit behind. They do. And all of a sudden, somebody that sits among us will make me turn flush red. Not just because of embarrassment, but of anger. Like, I, I say Romans chapter 6, what? What? Or I say, which is it? Bitter water or fresh water? The fruit you and I leave behind us as we pass through life lets people know what we really are. It is not the, the, the statement that we made at one point. It is the statement we make with our life. You cannot hide that. 
Andrew, you need to come. Otherwise, it'll be one o'clock before we get done today. I'm not going to give you a long invitation. We're going to go in the Lord's Supper very, very quickly. But you need to do what you need to do. I do not know whether you're still on the first question. What should I do to be saved? I don't know whether you've been living a lie because you don't have the evidences of repentance in your life. If you need to hear the question from God, what do I need to do? Well, if you're not saved or you're questioning it, you need to take care of that today. It is not my job to convince you of something that you may not have. Listen to what I said. It is not my job to convince you of something, here's the important word, may not have. You need to do what you should do. The second, you need to deal with the question, what is going to prevent you from being baptized? And the, basically the question is, it's no longer just about being baptized. That's just a, that's just a start. What he's saying is, what's going to stop you? What is hindering you from keeping one feet foot after another behind him? And then the third question. Do you really think that you can continue to live like a lost person and tell everybody else who asks that you're a Christian? Do you really think you can do that? If you are saved, you still need repentance. And all seven marks. And lastly, answer the question. Can godly, can godly water and ungodly water come out of the same place? And the answer is no. You're about to take the Lord's Supper. What does he want from you today? Will you stand? And you do business with him. Some of you won't need me. Thumper, I'm going to need you. Come on up just in case. Some of you don't need me. Some of you need to be over here. Some of you need the whole church. Because you're battling not just a sin. You're battling a whole army of demons. And you need a warrior team. A whole army to pray over you. Regardless, everybody needs to be getting ready for taking the Lord's Supper. So you need to do what you need to do in your heart today. If there was one question out of the four that I would leave with you, it would be the first. Do you know what you should do in order to be saved? And the answer is, run with all of your life. All of your life. Not just your words, your heart, your whole life. You run with all of your life to Jesus and you grab a hold of him because he's got his arms open and he's ready to grab a hold of you. You need help in any of that. Thumper's here, I'm here. There's deacons, there's other men. I see Chuck. There's plenty of people around here that are here. That, and, and there's plenty of women that you can go to if you need somebody to talk to. Do it quickly, right now.